So I want to just take the time, welcome everybody. This is our Life and Air Connect call for this month. Um, this is our global community call where we just want to bring together uh, many within the community and give everybody an opportunity not just to hear something or learn something new, but to connect with other people from around the country who are a part of Life and Air, who are buying into Life and Air principles. Um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, this is our global call. This is the global community where we can get together with everybody. But I do want to go ahead and just put out there that we have local groups popping up all around the country. Uh, some of those group leaders are joining us here on the call today. But uh, at this very moment, uh, we, uh, I think, uh, and don't hold me to this, but I think there's about seven to nine uh, groups out there and others forming. Uh, so there is the opportunity to connect and meet on a local level as well. And so some of you, uh, the reason that you heard of this call is because you're part of one of those local groups. I literally just got off the phone with one of our leaders who just had their first meeting. They had 38 people at their first meeting. They were super excited about that and uh, just really looking forward to building that community out uh, as, as they you know, do this. And, and their passion is ultimately they want to be able to share life and air principles and create a community of life and airs around them who they will be able to, you know, walk through life with and encourage one another and just experience an incredible life. So uh, today, the topic that we are going to be uh, just really discussing and contemplating is going to be flipping versus new construction. You've probably seen uh, the, the email is going out and, you know, not necessarily going to sit here and make a case for which one is better or which one is worse. Uh, I am grateful and thankful that as I'm looking at my screen right now, I see Tim Davis right in the middle because I did ask Tim if he would be interested in really participating uh, and, and sort of being a co-host almost with me on this particular one because Tim and I, we have... Uh, very similar experiences. We've both been in real estate for quite some time. Um, my start in real estate was as a flipper and a rehabber. Um, Tim was more of a new construction guy. And Tim has moved from new construction to flipping, and he much prefers flipping. And I have moved from flipping to new construction, sort of, and uh, and find my preference to be uh, doing more new houses. Now, having said that, I think there's uh, an appreciation that we both have for, um, I think Tim still has some appreciation for new construction and I still have appreciation for flipping. But uh, it, it'll make for an, uh, a good conversation just to hear our different perspectives as to why we uh, have landed where we've landed, why we like what we do, and hopefully you're all going to be able to get something out of that and benefit from what we share. Um, but before we do that, one of the things that I want to do is take a few minutes to really go ahead and give all of you an opportunity to maybe meet somebody new to network. And I'm gonna have Jason go ahead and break us out into uh, breakout rooms for uh, about five minutes or so. And you're gonna be put into a room with some, you know people who you may never have met before, but what we want you to do is just sort of introduce yourself, tell everybody a little bit about yourself and, and you know, maybe uh, make some connections that will be able to help you as you move forward. And so uh, we will make an announcement when we are bringing you back and uh, we'll get our discussion going. So Jason, can you go ahead and get that started? Yep. So you guys will be placed in a group with four to five other people. You will see an invite that you'll have to click on your screen to be added to the room. And then you'll see an announcement when your room is closing. Okay, so you should see that announcement right now. Um, and if you are, uh, get, that, get that button, just click it and it'll join. It's an invite to join the rooms. Then I'll call you when it's all time to come back. All right, just... Hopefully everybody had the opportunity to make some new connections. Structure. There are, I'm seeing a lot of, a lot of very familiar names on the call. A lot of great people. All 
All right. Well, I'm going to jump in and I, I'm going to get started. And I'm just going to start out first by just telling you a little bit about my background and my story. I'll try and make a brief. Uh, some of you probably already know it, know it well. Others uh, may never have heard it before, but I started my investing career in 1998. And uh, July 8th of 1998 was the first deal that I had ever picked up. And I had just come out of a failed restaurant business. And so the thing that, you know, I, I was completely broke. My credit was shot. I was deep in debt. I didn't have any income. And I was trying to figure out, you know, how do I make money in this game called real estate? And so after all the research and everything that I had done, you know, I did, I came across flipping, wholesale flipping in particular, and realized that, you know, you didn't have to have anything. You didn't need money. You didn't need credit. You didn't need experience. And so I, I realized I was qualified for that. And so it became my, uh, the, the type of investing that I started out with pursuing. Um, as a flipper, I uh, quickly started learning, hey, getting money to do deals was not that difficult to do. Uh, the call that I did last month was actually on raising uh, money to do deals and, and private money and, and just how to get it, where to find it. But I quickly found out that money was not difficult to get when you had a good deal. And so I found myself now buying houses and actually renovating them and not just being a wholesaler. So uh, I did uh, do an awful lot of renovations, um, particularly early in my career. Uh, I continued to keep on wholesaling. I was rehabbing houses, fixing and flipping them. And uh, I went through different phases of the, the renovation fix and flip. Uh, when I first got started, you know, values were not that high. I mean, some of the homes that I was buying to do the kind of renovations I would do today, it would have cost more to renovate the house than what the house was worth. Um, you know, $80,000 for a renovation. And that was sort of the ARV of the houses that I was buying. So we had to do small renovations, do as little as we could just to get them livable so that we were able to turn a profit on the back end when we sold them. And then as value started going up, we started doing more to help justify that increase in price. And then I went through a period of my uh, fix and flip career in Baltimore, where Baltimore was sort of the epicenter for flipping fraud. And uh, as a result of that, many of the lenders decided that they were going to start redlining and just not doing any lending in particular parts of Baltimore. Uh, in fact, what they really started targeting was a particular type of house. Baltimore is known for its row houses and it just tens and thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of row houses in Baltimore. And many lenders said, we're just not going to do loans on row houses anymore. So I actually pulled away from that and just started focusing on single family detached houses in the Baltimore market, uh, dealing in many of the older neighborhoods, 100 year plus old homes. And I became the guy who my specialty was buying houses, gutting them and completely rebuilding them and putting out almost brand new houses. Um, so that was what I had done for a while. I actually loved it. I loved taking an ugly house and turning it into something pretty, feeling like I did something really good for the community. It treated me really well. It uh, was something that uh, I, I made great money with and and my family was very blessed as a result of all of that that I had done. But in the back of my mind, uh, I, I have to just share one other thing that started this whole thought process. I wanted, uh, at, there was a point in my career when I wanted to be the biggest flipper in the country. My ego was big. I wanted to be bigger than everybody else. And, uh, and I knew that I needed to build and systematize a business to become that person. Well, as I was exploring and trying to figure out how would I do this, how would I pull this off, I was honest enough to admit that, you know, this is a business that can't be systematized. If it could be, there would be publicly traded rehab flip companies today, but there are none. And there is nobody out there who has been able to do that and to create a big business around it. And what I learned while I was looking at this whole, this whole thing and, and just trying to appreciate uh, what it took to build a business 
was that in order for you to have that kind of business, you needed to be able to systematize the entire process. And once you have a system, you have to be able to input something into the beginning, and then there's an output that comes out of the back end. And the problem with single family home uh, flipping is we don't ever have any clue of what inventory we're gonna get next month, how much of it we're going to get, we don't know what condition it's gonna be in, what part of town it's gonna to be in, what type of house it's going to be in. And there were just always, there's that in uncontrollable variable when it came to single family home renovations that you really, you could systematize certain parts of the process, but you couldn't systematize the whole business. But then when I looked at the new home builders, there's plenty of publicly traded new home builders and they have systems from beginning to end. They and for them, the input is, well, we just need to go get, tie up a bunch of lots. We're going to buy the lumber and all the materials, and we're just going to go through this process. We're going to build the same house, houses over and over again. And ultimately, we're going to kick out, you know, a finished product that uh, people want to have. So as I explored those two things, I came to recognize that rehabbing houses was the little man's business. It was something that the, the small person could do very well with. They could um, make a great living with it. It's a good business it, and, and don't get me wrong, but it's not something that you turn into this big, huge business machine that you know can ultimately one day take it public or sell it off or something like that. But it is a small business that if you focus and have a good model in place, you can make a very good income with it. And so I, I had an appreciation for that. But at the same time, I had this desire of how do I, you know, start to build homes. Uh, if, if all of you are like me, you know, as a guy who was used to rehabbing houses, there was something scary about building a new house. Um, the thought of having to take something from a, a raw piece of land, and then actually start digging the hole and doing all of these other things and putting the foundation in place was intimidating to me when I was first getting started. Uh, I will also just qualify that doing my first rehab was intimidating too, because I had never done it before, but um, it just seemed to have that extra layer of fear or unknown with building a house that sort of held me back for quite a while. Um, so it was always something that in the back of my mind that I just wanted to do. Um, I was closely observing a lot of people who were doing it and watching it and, and thought, you know, man, someday I, I want to be that guy. That, that's what I want to do. Now, um, that's a little bit of my story. And I, before I go further with it, I just want to give maybe Tim Davis an opportunity to maybe share a little bit about how he got started, because I think he took almost the exact opposite approach. Yeah, thanks, Steve. But yeah, I'd be happy to share. But I grew up, you know, in the construction business, my father was a master carpenter and superintendent for one of the biggest builders in Nashville. <clears throat> and uh, my goal was always to design and build houses. But I ended up with a remodeling company in the 80s. And so I learned that side of the business, but I wasn't remodeling for myself. I was remodeling for other people. But in 92, I got my contractor's license and started building. Had some mentors who helped me get started. But uh like Steve, I had a big ego. I wanted to be the biggest, best builder in town and had this huge vision. <clears throat> I wanted to be able to buy the land, develop the land, do all the building, handle all the sales. I wanted to have the whole thing front to back. Had no idea how that would ever come about, but that was my vision. And then six years after I got started in business, I built a reputation in the community and I got invited by the largest developer in the state of Tennessee, who also owned the largest real estate company in the state of Tennessee to come on board and start a new construction company with him. We were going to buy the land, develop it, build all the houses, and we we're going to handle the sales. And anyway, that was thought, wow, that's, that's, very, that's before I ever heard anything about divisions or how to create one, but, and dang, if it didn't come true. And that was a fun couple of years, but what I did, I ended up creating a bureaucratic job for myself where I was in the office all day, instead of out in the field. So I got very bored real quickly. So I left there and took what I learned there, which was more than an MBA probably could have taught me. But uh, 
I went out and started my own business again, and I started small, just me, and then I got a part-time bookkeeper. But I had everything systematized, just like Steve says. And, uh, and in fact, I had it so systematized that the state of Tennessee didn't believe I could possibly do what I was doing with only one part-time employee. So they came in and audited my books because they thought I was trying to hide employees and they wanted their payroll taxes. So they spent a whole year auditing my books and didn't find anything because I was, I was being, I was able to do all that because I had systems and I had computerized scheduling back before anybody ever heard of computerized scheduling. But anyway, a few years after that, I got kind of bored because building new houses is kind of like, you know, working on an assembly line in a factory is building the same widgets every day over and over. It got kind of boring and I was kind of sick of the business. I wanted to find a way out. But as I thought about it, I realized I'm not really sick of building. I'm just sick of some, certain parts of it. So I figured, okay, I'm going to keep this part here. I love, you know, doing deals and running pro, pro formas and trying to figure out how to put a group of investors together. That was fun. So I kept that part of it and I figured I'd hire superintendents to run the job and hire other people to do the estimating. So in order to do all that, though, I had to increase my volume and I wasn't able to do that with what finances I had and what credit I had. So I got the smart idea of, so I was running as S corporation. So I started LLCs on the side with four different big whales. We used their money and their credit to do more development. So my, my subchapter S corporation was a 51% partner in the LLCs. So I had all these satellite LLCs revolving around the S corp and the satellite LLCs would hire the S corp to build a house at cost and all profit would go back to the, to be split in the, anyway, it was, it got really big, really fast. And it was so big when things crashed, I crashed with it. So at the time of in 2008, I had 17 spec houses. I had 33 vacant lots, I had an 18 lot high end subdivision going all highly leveraged and all it was, it was over $20,000 a month I was paying in interest to the banks when everything crashed. So unfortunately the bank still wanted all their interest payments, even though nothing was selling anymore. So okay. I had to start all over at the age of 48 and I started flipping because all of a sudden there was all these houses available to flip on the MLS every day, you know, another 15, 20 foreclosures, just pick a couple of them that look good. The bank would take whatever you offered usually. So, and I learned, man, I can do these in half the time and make twice the profit I was making on new construction. So, and I, plus it's not boring. It's every job is different. Every day is different. So I started loving that way more. So, so since 2008, I've built probably four or five houses, maybe six. I can't remember. I, I build every once in a while when an opportunity comes along. And I would probably build right now if I found the right land, the right price but haven't been able to find that. So right now I'm still flipping. So there's my story in a nutshell. All right. So you, you hear a little bit about both of our backgrounds. And, you know, for me, I started my investing career in Baltimore and that's where I was doing, you know, all of my flipping. And then in 2009, I decided to make a move and we actually packed up, left Maryland. We went to Wisconsin. And I went there really just to slow down and to enjoy life and to be a dad and a father. And, and so we went to this little town. So you got to keep in mind, I went from a metro area that had over a million people to a little small town in the Midwest that had 12,000 people. And it was a, you know, a major, major difference. Uh, I had figured that, hey, when I get here to Wisconsin, I'm just going to do a couple of flips a year. Uh, I just want something to do, but you know, I, I don't need to break my back trying to make a living in, in real estate anymore. I just want to do a little bit just to have fun and, and enjoy it. So I ended up picking up a flip, it took me about six months. Um, the opportunities were nowhere near as abundant. It was just a tiny little town. Uh, I remember when I uh, first got there, the MLS had, and this is right after the market crash. The MLS had about 200 houses in the MLS uh, total and for that whole area. Uh, today, and I had just recently looked, there were 22 and seven of them were by the same builder. So it was only about 15 houses on the market in that particular area. 
but that just sort of gives you a little bit of an insight into what I was dealing with there. When I was in Baltimore, there would be hundreds of new listings every day. Um, and, and Baraboo, Wisconsin, I just didn't have much. So uh, it wasn't easy to come across deals. I ended up, by the time I did my fourth flip, I was working <clears throat> with the same contractor repeatedly and he was encouraging me, well, Steve, I'd love to do more for you. Why don't you start building houses? And I said, you know, I've always wanted to, but, you know, I don't know enough about it. I don't know, you know, exactly what it's going to cost. And, you know, the market's not that good right now. So, you know, I'm, I'm not really willing to take that big jump. You know, a new house is going to cost a lot of money. And in this town, nothing sells for 200000 We We could count uh, in the previous three years when he and I were having this discussion, there was one house that sold for over $200,000 in three years time. And the thought of, you know, going out there and building new houses is just like, no way I can't, you know, I'm not going to do it, but he just kept on pressing. So I finally said, okay, look, here's the deal. If we can come up with a product that we can build and I can sell for the price of the existing inventory comparable to what houses will sell for, um, I'll consider it. So everyone got together and just started sharpening their pencils and coming up with a plan, a house design that we could come up with uh, that would be cheap to build. Um, meeting with the building suppliers, meeting with the real estate agents and different subcontractors and, and really pulled this thing together to where it looked like, you know what, I can build a house. We could sell it for $169,000 and I can still make some money on these. And if we can do that, then I'm, uh, I'll, I'll do it. So we, we came up with what looked like to be pretty good numbers. And I went and I bought three lots. And one of the ways that we could keep our expenses down was by doing multiple projects, not, not just one at a time. So we were doing three of them at a time. And uh, we, we broke ground on one. Four weeks later, we broke ground on the next one. Four weeks later, we broke ground on the next one. So we could just move subs from one project to the next. And uh, so uh, now having said that, I, just, I do want to say that I did build two new houses in Baltimore before I had left. And my uh, experiences with those were, uh, one was okay, and the other one was fair, okay. Um, uh, they, neither one of them was what I would have called, you know, hey, a great deal where I was completely sold on it. I knew what the shortcomings were, the people who I was dealing with, the builders and things like that. Um, but, you know, I ended up spending much more money on those than I had anticipated. And it took a little while to really crack the code for me to figure out how do these new home builders actually do what they do and build houses for the prices that they do. But then uh, we started discovering that. And long story short, at a time when no homes were selling, all of my homes sold right away. We put one on the market. We had uh, two, bit, two offers on it within a couple of days. Uh, the next one went on the market, sold within a couple of days, and the third one sold before we put it on the market because they saw how quickly the other ones were selling that we immediately had somebody there. And then with that in mind, I had buyers lining up who were waiting for the next houses that we were building, asking me to build more. And at that moment, I didn't have any plans to, to build more. I was first, let's see how this works out and let's see where this goes. So. Um, I ended up doing quite a, a bit more. So I ended up building uh, probably over 40 houses in the Baraboo, Wisconsin area uh, before I ended up moving from Baraboo to now I'm in Tennessee. So what did I learn uh, about that? First of all, uh, there's a couple of things that I want to just put out there. There's not a right or wrong answer. And it's not that one of these is better or worse than the other. I think uh, at Life and Air, as a coach, I'm always going to try to help somebody figure out what type of investing best suits your vision. You know, the life that you want to live, which one of what type of investing, and it might not even be flipping, it might not be new construction, it might not be real estate that you should be pursuing to live and experience the life that you want to live. But, you know, ultimately, it's your vision that should dictate it. Uh, having said that, there's sometimes outside circumstances that will also contribute to which direction do you go? If I wanted to build a large flipping business in Baraboo, Wisconsin, it just wasn't going to happen. Um, you know, at, at best, if I were aggressively pursuing every single thing that came available in town, I might have gotten three or four deals a year. 
uh, it just wasn't going to, it was just too small of a town to build a business around it. So, um, but it was a growing town and being a growing town, we needed more inventory. We needed more houses and new houses uh, were easy to sell. So we took uh, part of, you know, what the market was giving us and developed the business plan around what the market was giving us. Um, I love sharing this one story, just uh, something to help all of you get a picture of it. Uh, a student of mine who was a, a just really came up from starting to do some deals here or there. He learned from me. He took my methods and he went out there and he tried to apply my wholesaling techniques to the T. He wanted to build his business exactly the way I built mine, but it wasn't working for him. And it was one key thing that I built my business largely around the lenders and the money that was available to me. I had a, a couple of private money lenders and two banks that would finance my purchasers. And I built my entire business around what those lenders would do. My student did not have those kinds of lenders. In fact, when he went to the banks, he, he did exactly what I told him to do. He went into the banks and he told them, hey, I'm looking to buy wholesale real estate and I was wondering if you would finance my buyers. And their question is, well, who are your buyers going to be? And he says, well, it's going to be other investors. They said, no, we don't want that business. And they told him, if you're selling to homeowners, we would be interested in doing it. And I said, well, go talk to another bank. And he went and he talked to another bank and they told him the same thing. And he talked to another bank and they told him the same thing. And it was odd because they just had a different philosophy amongst all the lenders in that town. Whereas back in Baltimore, my lenders were happy to finance other investors. They didn't want to do fixer uppers to homeowners. They wanted to do it to other investors. And, and it was just a different mindset. So here's my point with that. He revamped his model to where he was buying wholesale deals, but flipping them to owner occupants, homeowners. He wasn't flipping them to other investors. And he took what the market gave him. He took what was that, um, just made available and it, he was wildly successful with it. And so um, sometimes you just have to see what the market is giving you. Now, for me, as a new person in Tennessee, I am, you know, I came here, the number one, the reason that we came to Tennessee was to bring my boys here to go to a private school here in town. And I said, I'm going to figure out what I do after I get there. I, I didn't come in and research or do anything in advance. I didn't know what I would do. Um, I just said, you know, I, I know I know enough. I'll figure it out. And so took it easy for a while and just tried getting settled in. And then I started looking. And now I have lots of experiences. I, I have rental properties. I've done new construction. I've done all kinds of flips. I do lending. Uh, you know, I, I have a, a whole you know, a couple decades of experiences that I can draw from. And as I came in here, uh, I've, I've done more marketing in the last, I've spent more money on marketing in the last four to six months than I spent on marketing in 10 years in Wisconsin. And I've produced no results with my marketing yet. Um, my mm -hmm. marketing to date now that has produced any results has been 100% networking and talking with other people. And I've been doing everything from exploring joint venturing with flippers to you know maybe be the person who puts the money up and helps them to do more deals to uh, taking some newer people who are hungry and maybe educating them and coming alongside of them and lending them the money to having wholesalers flip deals to me, uh, to talking to builders um, and, and so I've been exploring all of it and I've been just having as many discussions as I can trying to figure out where to go for a while. I was getting really discouraged on the new construction side of things. Every builder I was talking to was just, I was hitting a dead end. It was hard to get them to even return my phone calls. Um, you know, to, to, to have the first conversation, I, they were just, they're all so busy, but the pricing that they were giving me literally was five times more than what it would cost me to build a house in Wisconsin. And uh, then I finally got to one guy who was maybe three times more than what it was costing me to build a house in Wisconsin. And I, 
thought, okay, I'm making some progress here. At least we're moving in the right direction, but it still doesn't work. I can't, I'm not going to make a living doing this. And, uh, and I started thinking, maybe I'm just going to get my own contractor's license. I'm going to become the GC and I'm going to build this business up from scratch. I know what to do. I know how to do it. I was never the contractor when I was building houses. I, I literally just was writing checks and, you know, calling the shots and finding the deals and things like that. So um, then I got, I got introduced to a builder here and he's a fairly new builder in town. He's only been here for two years, but he shared with me what his vision was. And his vision was, man, I just want to build houses. I don't like doing custom. I'm doing a couple of custom homes right now. And I love my customers, but man, they drive me crazy. They change their mind in the middle of the project. They want to put, you know, pull this out and put this in. They want to make this bigger. They want to do that. And then they don't want to pay me for it. And he says, they, they get mad when I have to ask them for more money to make the changes that they want to make. They think it's easy and they think it costs me nothing. But he says, I just want to build spec houses. And my dream is to come across somebody who, you know, has the money and sort of the know-how and the expertise who understands this business that would, you know, fund the deals and help me. And I'll just get on out there and I can focus on building houses and we can sell these houses. And I was like, man, this is like a a dream come true. It's, you know, this was an answer to my prayers because it was exactly what we were looking for. And so we sat down, we started crunching the numbers and uh, it's costing me more, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But part of it is materials cost more. There's such a demand, you know, right now for contractors that that labor has gone up. Uh, But here's the beauty. We figured out what it will cost for us to build a house. And now it was a matter of where can I put those houses what part of town can I put that house in to justify, you know, building it and, and making money? And to make a long story short, we're going to be all in, all in, including realtor commissions and everything. Uh, our budget, the projected budget right now is about $260,000 is what we will be all in on our houses. And those homes are going to sell for three seventy five dollars to three ninety nine. dollars um, My real estate agent says we'll get four forty nine, dollars but, uh, uh, I'll stick with my 375 to 399 figure. If he gets us 449, uh, it's it's an even better deal. Uh, um, with that in mind, that number that I just shared with you is the builder contributing his time and energies as sweat equity, and he and I are going to be joint venture partners, um, splitting the profits on those deals. So for me, um, I've been pursuing flips. I've been pursuing, you know, trying to get deals, being the new guy in the market, uh, trying to uh, get that marketing to work for me. I'm not giving up on my marketing. I'm going to continue to keep on doing it because uh, as, as somebody who has been teaching people for many, many years, you have to consistently do it. You can't just go in and stick your toe in the water for 30 days and say, oh, it didn't work and then stop doing it. I always tell my students, you have to be committed to it for a minimum of six months if not a year of, of marketing before you really start to see it paying off. And so I, I'm going to continue to pursue that. Now, having said that, with new construction going on, I'm not going to be interested in rehabs. My goal is going to be to just take any of the flips that I get and turn them very quickly and, and keep my focus on the new construction side of things because those numbers are very um, predictable for us right now. And I've already got multiple lots lined up. I bought two uh, just to get started and to make sure that everything with this relationship with this builder is going to work out, that we have our numbers done. So uh, we can build the same house over and over. We're going to use the same colors because the lots aren't right next door to one another. And uh, so we don't have to go through that whole decision making process over and over again. It's just it's the same thing. Um, like Tim said, that can get boring, but I always tell people in business, boring is good. And, uh, you know, when, when something's boring and it's making you money, uh, it's, it's a good thing because you just keep on doing the same boring thing and you make that boring thing work. And when that's working for you, then you have the opportunity to do some more fun things, uh, because the boring thing affords you that opportunity. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there for a second and, and see what, what Tim wants to share. There we go. Wrong. I was hitting the wrong button. 
Um, well, I don't have a whole lot to share, really. You know, right now I would be building, if I could, find deals on lots. Lot prices are through the roof. And in order to build the house on the lot, you got to build a high-end house. And what I got burned on back in the 08 crash was if I had done, been building low-end houses, I could have rented them out for enough cash to cover the bank notes. But at this point, I don't know if I want to get into the high end stuff again and then get caught. I guess I'm still gun shot from the OA crash. So if you've been through that, you can probably understand why, but, uh, I'm, I'm doing fine right now, just doing flips. So that's where I'm going to stick right now. Unless something just falls in my lap. I'm not actively looking for lots or opportunities. Now. So one thing, and particularly just so everyone uh, can understand where both Tim and I are coming from today. We're both at a point in our life. Neither one of us is interested in building a really big business. Um, you know, if, if Tim wanted to build a big business, he might feel a little bit different about that. But, uh, you know, he does want to stretch himself to where his, you know, to the capacity that he has. And uh, if he can do more flips, he wants to do more flips. Um, same goes for me with new construction, but uh, I already shared with you what the margins look like they're going to be. And, and for argument's sake, you know, we're going to be a hundred to, uh, 140,000 net profit on these houses. And that's how forgiving the market is for us at this very moment. Um, I can make a $40,000 mistake and these deals are still good. Um, and that's provided that the market stays the way it currently is. Again, my real estate agent says I'm about $50,000 off um, that we'll get more for these houses. And I can see why he says that the comps are there to justify it. But uh, with that in mind, you know, my interest is in doing four to six of these a year. And, uh, and the builder is pretty much of the same mindset. He's not interested in breaking his back. Uh, we did have a question uh, in the chat that said, you know, how long does it take to build a house from start to finish? Uh, when all things are working well and you have everything lined up, uh, we were typically building and the builder, this builder feels the exact same thing, about 110 days, uh, just under four months to build a house from start to finish. Uh, one of the challenges that uh, he finds uh, with custom houses and custom houses, it takes a lot longer. It's seven, eight months, nine months. Um, that's buyers coming in, approving things, taking long to decide what they want to put in, uh, waiting for draws from the bank to come. Uh, and that's one of his big issues. Uh, since I'm going to be paying cash for everything, we can keep everything moving. We can keep it moving quickly. He never has to wait for money or disbursements. Um, we can get contractors to show up on our job sites quickly because they know that the moment they're finished, they get paid. And so they might show up on our job site to do work before they go to a different job site where they're not gonna get their check for 30 to 60 or maybe even 90 days. And so uh, that same principle works for flipping or new construction. Um, uh, you know, that, that's not something that's exclusive to one or the other. So, um, how, what is your cost per square foot for your builds in Tennessee? So I will uh, tell you this, we had it down uh, to a conservative. Um, the, the builder wanted to build a house, a 1600 square foot house on a slab. And he was saying that we can build it on the slab for, it's cheaper to do it on a slab. Um, and yes, I agree that a slab is cheaper than a crawl space, a, a slab is cheaper than a basement, but in you know Wisconsin, uh, almost every house has a basement. Here and down south, there are homes with slabs and crawl spaces, and a basement is actually rare here. But for us in Wisconsin, I purposely made the most of our basements. Uh, I was building a 1,600 square foot ranch in Wisconsin. Uh, this guy, it's uncanny. His building plans. His house plans are almost exactly the same as the house that I was building in Wisconsin. But we always put a basement in our houses and we were very particular with the way that we did it. Uh, even if we were on a flat lot, we elevated the basements. We only went about four feet deep. We didn't go eight feet deep. We, uh, we went four feet deep 
so that we could get exposure. Now we were trying to get as much exposure in that basement as we could so that we could put in full size windows. And in our basements, we were putting in 48 inch sliders. They were not those little basement hoppers. And the reason I did that was because I wanted to get as much use of that basement as I could. We had to put the basement in anyway. And now it only cost me about 15 to $20 a foot to finish the basement. Um, it's already there. And let's just throw out $20 a foot. I'd finish off a thousand square feet in the basement for $20,000. And you, you, now you take a 1600 square foot home and you just turn it into a 2600 square foot home. I took a five bedroom, I'm sorry, a three bedroom, two bath home and turned it into a five bedroom, three bath home with a large family room in the basement. And it only cost me $20,000 extra to get all that additional space in the basement. Uh, here in Tennessee, at the very moment, the areas that we're looking to build in, these homes are selling for anywhere from $150 to $180 a foot. And they're getting the same price for a nicely done basement. So if there's a thousand square feet in the basement, they're getting that 150 bucks a foot for the basement as well. So I had to talk with the builder and I said, all right, here's where we're at. Your 1600 square foot home, you're at, uh, you, we're conservative. We know we can get it done for 110 a foot. We're fairly certain we can get that down to hundred or just a little bit below um, as we sharpen our pencil. And I said, Mm, not really enough to get me super excited. And then I finally said to him, I said, trust me, put a basement in. And I said, you know, you're already talking the crawl space is going to run you around, you know, 11,000. Then by the time we do the masonry work and everything on the crawl space, uh, we're going to be at around 15,000. These subdivisions we're looking at are going to require brick or stone on the crawl space. So we're already spending a good bit of money for an extra $15,000. I can get a basement in. And then an extra 20, I can go ahead and finish that basement. So for $35,000 more, we'll create a thousand square feet of finished space that we can get $150,000 for it. So I said, that's the best return I've ever heard. I can spend 35,000 and get 150. We're gonna do that all day long. And uh, the, his goal initially was, well, you know, I wanna just sell houses that are affordable that we can you know, sell for 250, 260,000. I said, I love it too. But I said, the reality of the situation is it seems to me that 375 is affordable today. That seems to be falling into the affordable house category. And, uh, and, and I don't know how many of you feel that same way, but that's a cheap house in this area right now. And if I can offer new houses that uh, are, are quality built and we can offer them for that $375,000 number, uh, we, we are putting out a good product. The good news is we also have a lot of room to move. If the market were to correct or something like that, um, we, we have room to move and, and shouldn't get hurt in doing so. So that's a little bit of where we're at. So uh, I want, when I said the 260, that includes us finishing the basement and somebody had asked, what is the lot? Um, uh, the two lots that I purchased right now I paid 33,000 for one lot and 20 for the other. Uh, the one that uh, was 20, they were asking 30 for it. Um, They're both in the same subdivision. And uh, I, I, I decided that for the builder's sake, I didn't want him you know, buying one lot in one subdivision and another one 20 minutes away. Uh, these are about a quarter of a mile away from one another. So make it much easier for him. The one I got for less money is uh, off the road. It's, we got to put about 150 foot driveway in, but it's tucked off uh, behind some of the other lots. It's a beautiful lot, uh, but I offered less because of the driveway, but we're still going to put up the exact same house. You won't be able to see these two homes that no people aren't going to recognize that they're both the exact same house um, because of the way they're situated. Uh, if anybody who looks closely or looks at them both is going to recognize it, but just driving through, you wouldn't know that there's two of the same houses going up. So that's a, a little bit more detail there. Um, any, any other questions there? Well, in the Nashville area, if you can find a lot under $100,000, you better jump on it. 
because that's that's rare mm -hmm. and uh it's crazy it's crazy and building costs are pushing 150 a foot that's what i'm also on a crawl space yeah the builders most of the builders i have talked to are anywhere from 170 to 250 a foot here right now wow. and we just talked to one who's at 400 a foot and uh the 250 a foot builders are booking out two years from now they're signing contracts to get started two years out um uh in the greater knoxville area those lots are uh, you, you're hard pressed to find a lot for under 100 in the greater in, in i'm sorry in metro knoxville i'm getting outside of the area to get those lots um uh, i was literally just considering one at about 129,000 that just came on the market that's in Knoxville. The same house that we're building for 375 would probably sell for 650 on that $129,000 lot. So, uh, but I don't wanna bring the builder up that far. So it's, uh, I don't wanna spread him out too thin. So um, without, uh, I wanna just talk real quick. Um, before I get into answering some more of these other questions, um, I want to not lose focus of, you know, the fact that these things should fit your vision, but uh, maybe have uh, Tim and I share with you some of what the pros of flipping are, what the pros of um, new construction are, and then maybe what some of the cons are. And so um, some of the things that have already come up, and I'll try to summarize, uh, flipping can be quick. They can be quick turnarounds. Um, you know, a new construction, once you get your systems going and you get things rolling, it's very conceivable that from beginning to end, it can be about 110 days. Um, and that is pretty much a standard for many uh, spec home builders, particularly new, uh, new construction builders. That's, that's what they would do. But uh, you can do a, a quick flip sometimes in two weeks, uh, you know, 30 days. Is, is pretty much a standard for many. So you can be in and out of them quicker. Um, flipping is relatively easy to get money for. Um, it was easy when I first got started. I thought it was hard, but I think it's even easier today. There's so much money out there that if you don't have money, but you get a deal, people will put the money up for it. Um, some of the, the cons for maybe flipping is it's not easy to get a deal. You've got to, you've got to work pretty hard, especially today to get a deal. Um, they're not that, that easy to come by, but for those who are consistently marketing, they're consistently getting leads and consistently getting deals. Uh, most of the people I'm talking to are actually down in volume, but they're making a whole lot more money on each deal that they do get. Um, and in spite of being down in volume, they're making more money than ever. They're having career years. Um, much harder to systematize the flipping business. The flipping business is um, that you can systematize certain parts of it. You can systematize your marketing. You can maybe systematize, hey, here's you know, how we do our rehabs. Um, these are the types of kitchens that we wanna put in or here's the thing we wanna do, but every house is different. So it requires uh, some different uh, input. Uh, there's more unknowns with flipping and we have little control of our volume and inventory. We don't know what we're gonna get. Um, new construction pros is that we can systematize it, that it's, it's easy to put systems in place from beginning to end. Um, banks understand the new construction process. Uh, I think more and more banks are understanding flipping, but when I got started in the business, I had to almost teach them you know, what it was like um, to lend to rehabbers. And that basically it was the same thing as a construction project. Instead of buying a lot, they were buying a house that was that they were going to have to do work to. Um, uh, it's in my opinion, it's easier to get lots. And one of the things about lots are um, is that you can buy a number of them all in the same place. And so the one thing that I always talked about uh, when I would have people out to see what I was doing in Baraboo, Wisconsin, was I could stand on the front porch of one of my deals. And from there, I could see the next one that I was doing. I could see the other one that was going on. I could see a fourth one that was going on. 
and I could just look down the street and I could see the deals I was going to do for the next year and a half. And, uh, and so while everyone else was out there trying to find their next deal, I already knew where all of mine were and I could see them. So that, that was something that I actually liked. Um, most contractors prefer working on new construction versus rehabs. Um, that's not the case for all of them, but it is the case for most of them. Um, they will do their, their rates on new construction are typically much cheaper than rehabs because rehabs have a lot more retrofitting or they got to tear something out before they put something in where when they show up at a new construction job site, everything's ready to go. So just as an example, we can get a roofer to install a new roof for uh, today, 50 to $60 a square. You know, we provide the materials, the labor is 50 to $60 a square. Um, if it was a rehab where they have to do a tear off and other stuff, oftentimes it's around 150 a square. Um, it's, it's considerably more that they, they've got to tear it off. They might have to do some repairs, different workarounds. Um, the cons for new construction is sometimes bureaucracy and permits and approvals and things like that. You can get really held up. You know, a lot of people do renovations without having to have building inspectors out there. Um, they might not even be pulling permits. Um, the, the job doesn't require that. But when you get into a situation, uh, you know, I started out with building in Wisconsin where when we called up the building inspector. He was there in 15 minutes and, you know, project really never stopped. Uh, things didn't change except for the building inspector, but we got a new building inspector when we called her. She'd say, well, I'll be out there in three days. I was like, no, wait, no, <laughs> you're not busy. Get out here. And she's like, no, I'll be there in three days. And she just decided she wanted to hold up our projects. And, uh, and so they, we had to start learning to calling her three days in advance of when we actually needed her and hope that we had the work done by the time she got there. But uh, um, we had to just start playing, playing different games. Uh, but uh, the same thing happens with, you know, waiting to get your building permit. Um, and it does turn out that Tennessee is very favorable. We can pull our building permit and have it by the end of the day. I could do that in Wisconsin. When I was in Maryland, I could apply for my building permit and it could take three to four weeks to actually get the building permit. And, you know, so the idea then was to try to get all of that stuff in place before you actually even bought the lot, get the, get the building permit so that you try to time it to, uh, you got your permit approved the day that you were settling on the lot, something like that. And uh, the time to build for new construction can take longer than flipping. Um, Tim, do you have any other maybe pros and cons that you would add to that? Uh, well, I think you covered most of it. Uh, for me, like I told you before, the con with new construction is if you're, you know, it gets boring because it's the same thing every day. But that is uh, also a benefit because I could, you know, I was doing subdivisions. So I, just like you, I could drive through and see every house I have under construction in, in one hour and head back out. And I was doing them all every every. Kitchen was the same color. Every floor was the same pattern. Every carpet was the same. Every wall color was the same. So all my subcontractors knew exactly what to do. And I had my lighting packages for each floor plan already bought and you know specified at the lighting store, so they knew exactly what to ship. So it was all just systematized to the max. So that was a really good thing, but it's not very challenging if you like a challenge. So, but yeah, the. The permit process and getting held up by inspections, and especially in my area, the electrical inspections have oftentimes held me up by one to two weeks just waiting on electrical inspection. And then if it fails for some reason, then you got another week to wait for the reinspection. So that can be hair pulling, especially when you have a house that's already sold with the promised deadline that, and you're trying to meet that deadline. And of course, the customers don't understand that they say they do, but they really don't understand that you know that things are outside of your control. So. Yeah, exactly. If anybody wants to get into new construction, I've got plenty of things to share with you. 
Um, so Justin asked the question, said things are crazy in Florida. I, Justin, I think it's crazy all over the country. Um, we I was talking with a student the other day who had 38 offers on one of their houses. Um, we're, we're seeing um, it's, it's the same story almost everywhere. Uh, I haven't heard of anybody who's in a slow market right now. Um, inventory is just way down. I just spoke to my brother yesterday who is a licensed uh, real estate agent in Raleigh, North Carolina. He said, Steve, when I got my license, there were 18,000 houses in the MLS. He said, there's 2,200 right now and uh, to serve the entire area. Um, the entire Knoxville metro area historically runs at 12 to 13,000 houses. Um, there are currently 1,500 available houses serving 12 counties and uh, they are turning over in two to three days is, is what's typical. Anything that is staying out there for more than a week, the buyers are, I mean, it, it's almost a, I'm just gonna ask some crazy number and see if somebody's willing to pay it kind of situation. And what's happening is even they're selling because people are just getting frustrated with not being able to get anything. Um, Lawrence, uh, so lot costs 10 to 20% of the back end sales price. You know, there's a, always this historic thing where people would have this rule of thumb as far as what the lot costs should be. Um, I, th there's too many disparities to say, hey, this is what the lot should cost compared to what the back end sales price is going to be. Um, they, uh, you know, always, uh, the, the new home builders would always tell us, well, you know, the, the lot should be about a quarter of the price of what the back end is going to be. Now, that didn't always make sense. I mean, I, at the end of the day, I still think it comes down to what's the house going to cost. Uh, you know, my brother uh, lives in a neighborhood where the homes are $2 million. And, you know, for the longest time, the lots were 100000 And now those lots are 600000 and, um, but it, it's, and it, it's still $2 million houses, but it's, it's just, it's hard to say, you know, what it should be. Uh, I see hundred thousand dollar lots in $400,000 neighborhoods. And I see hundred thousand dollar lots in million and a half dollar neighborhoods. I think it's just a matter of the product that you put on there. Um, how are you anticipating costs of $100 a square foot when other builders are one and a half to two times that? It's a great question. Those builders who are doing the one and a half to two times that were $150 to $200 a foot are one, building custom homes. Two, they're building their profits into that. Um, but here's the other big thing. Um, I, and I will stand behind this. Uh, it happens quite frequently when I talk to people. The new home builders, they get it. They understand. They know how to build a house and keep the cost down. And it's a very unemotional process for them. And I, when I say, when I refer to that, I'm talking about the big ones. I'm talking about the publicly traded new home builders. It's really just a cookie cutter. They're putting out that same thing over and over. When you talk to a smaller builder who is doing a lot of custom, uh, they think that their job is to go out and find, you know, the, the best electricians with the best price. And I'm just going to use that as an example. And I'll share a real world story with you. When I first started building in Wisconsin, uh, the builder went and he got three electrical quotes. His three quotes were 11,500, 12,000 and 14,000. That was the three quotes that he got. And he said, well, we're going to go with the $11,500 guy. Now I said, no, we're not. And he said, why? They're the best priced one. I said, you just called the three most expensive electricians in town. You know, that's that 11,500 is way too much. We're not spending 11,500 on the electrical of this house. And he's like, well, what should it be? I said, you're the builder. You tell me, what should it be? He said, 11,500. That's, you know, that was the best of three. That unfortunately is the pro approach that most general contractors take. I told him, I said, it's about 5,500 to 6,000 is what it should be on these houses. And at first he thought, there's no way. I mean, these guys are twice as much as that. So um, I told him, I said, well, I, you need to keep on looking. We're not hiring any of those guys. It took him probably a few weeks and then he found a single guy, you know, electrician. He didn't have a big company. He worked uh, by himself out of his truck. 
And it was just getting started. And the guy agreed to do our houses for $5,500 a house. And with the promise that he would get multiple jobs, he wasn't going to do just one house. And so all of a sudden he realized, oh, I can get it done for $5,500. And, you know, the same situation with the plumbers and the HVAC guys and and things like that. So uh, I'm going to take this story. I'm going to fast forward two years from that, uh, from that time. Uh, An electrician driving through the neighborhood, he's got his son with him in the van. And his son says, dad, how many of these houses have you done? And his dad was embarrassed to admit that he didn't do any of them. And all these houses are going up. I'm, I'm the person building them all. And the electrician didn't get any of them. And the electrician, he tells the story. He says, and I thought to myself, these things are a, a mile up the road from my house and I'm not getting any of them. That's not right. You know, I, I need to figure out what I need to do to get in on this. And so he called us and he said, well, what's it going to take for me to get those jobs? And uh, we told him and he said, well, let me sharpen my pencil. Then he came back and this guy's got a big electrical company, many employees, lots of vans. And they great reputation. They do a great job. And he told us $5,875 per house. Now, um, we were supplying the light fixtures, but they would install them and, and get everything else done. So 5875 per house, he wanted to get all of them if, if we would give it to him. And we gave it to him. He was the guy who quoted us 11500 two years earlier. And so I just want to put that into perspective. Um, plumbers will come on out and a rule of thumb for plumbing. They sometimes say, you know, how many connection points? You know, there's a toilet and a sink and a shower in the bathroom. That's three connection points. And there's three connection points in this other bathroom. And then there's, you know, three connection points between the refrigerator, the dishwasher and the sink and the kitchen. And they just count up connection points and they multiply it by a certain number. And that's what they charge. Um, They have other rules of thumb that, you know, just how many bathrooms uh, and then they come up with the price based off of that. Um, So when they use that rule of thumb pricing, it's designed to be a safe number for them that includes everything and a lot of profit but when we get down and we sit down with them and we talk to them about, Hey, here's what we're going to do. You'll get multiple projects from us. You don't have to worry about the sales process and things like that. And all of a sudden the numbers get better. Uh, I'll share with you a conversation that we had with roofers. And, you know, in fact, this, we just had this with roofers right now um, to get them to come down on their price. So uh, when I was first starting there in Wisconsin, I was talking to roofers and I asked them how much they would charge us uh, to do our roof. You know, new house, we'll supply the materials. You just come on out. It was 26 square. They were telling us $2,600. And I said, okay, um, how long is it going to take for you to do that? I said, well, you know, I'll have a, uh, we'll have a couple of guys out there. We'll knock it out in a day. And I said, all right. So three guys. And he said, no, two. I said, all right, two guys out there for one day and it's $2,600. I said, man, I'm in the wrong business. I need to go into roofing. And I just said, seriously, how much do your guys need to make for a day's worth of work? And then all of a sudden they're like, oh, you know, it's, they, they, they're going to make a killing. They were probably going to pay those guys $150 each and put over $2,000 in their pocket um, for, you know, getting things done just for the labor. So, uh, and we ended up with that roofer he had started agreeing to just do all of our roofs for $1,400 and then had another guy who would do it by himself. One guy, he would be out there for 12 or 13 hours and he would do it by himself for 700 bucks. It was one day's worth of work for him, $700. He would do it. Having said that, um, uh, it's not that easy uh, today, uh, but I'm just sharing that with you just to, get into the head and understand the thinking of what is going on. You need to know what the real prices are, not just accept what every contractor tells you. Now, a quick tip, whether you are doing rehabs or new construction, uh, what I love to do and the best place to find contractors is going into new home subdivisions. Go into a subdivision where the big builders are putting up a ton of houses. They already have all of those guys in there trained to work for the best prices. And so uh, they don't employ those people. They're not their employees. They're all subcontractors. 
and to just go on in and talk to them and say, hey, are you interested in more work? They always want more work. And uh, if they'll charge you anything close to what they're doing the work for, for those big builders, you're going to get far better pricing than you get elsewhere. Um, so uh, where I learned that was from the project manager that built one of my homes in, in Maryland. Uh, he worked for Ryan Homes, which is a publicly traded company. Uh, he was a project manager who built about 40 houses a year for Ryan Homes. And he was the one who was telling me what all of the pricing was that they were paying. Uh, and Ryan Homes would, you know, contract with a roofer and you will get 100 of our roofs. And they were, they were paying at that time. This was going back a number of years, about 12 years ago, uh, $25 a square per roof they were getting the HVAC systems done in every house for 5,500 bucks. They were, um, uh, I, I don't remember all the other prices, but to make a long story short, those guys were already trained. They, you know, when I could come along and say, I'll give you 50 bucks a square for a roof, that was double the money that they were getting from the, the other builders. So they're the, best place to go to find contractors, especially when you're doing new construction. But a lot of those guys will do stuff on the side with your rehabs as well. So just a tip. Um, how do we get it down to um, uh, to the hundred dollars a foot? I mean, we've just sitting here, we've been pricing everything out and coming up with the real costs. And that when, when we have the right subcontractors in there and we're focused, uh, I focus on every line item when it comes to a, a new construction project. Um, uh, if I can get my plumber to shop around for different fixtures, uh, you know, I'll, uh, and, you know, they'll tell me, Hey, my fiberglass tub surround is $700. And so well, I know a place you can get it for 495. Do you mind going there? And, you know, it knocks $200 off of my price. Um, and, and so I try to help all of them by pointing them in the right direction and I've done that with a number of the, the subcontractors as well. They have their preferred sources that they like to work with, but they're open. Most of them are open to doing other things and to help get the price down because ultimately that helps them out too. Um, and so how do you know what it should cost? And, you know, Renee, that's a great question. Um, you know, for me, it just came from experience. Um, but I think it's asking around a lot and it's getting around the, you know, today in this social media world, you can say, Hey, I just spoke with an electrician who quoted me this much for a house was $11,000. What do you all think? And immediately you're going to have people saying, no, 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 that's too much. You know, you know, I, I got a guy right now, we just did a house and it was 7,500 or, and, and, and that's, you know, that's going to be one of the best ways to, to figure that out today. But going back to what I had asked the roofers, how long is it going to take you? I would ask the electrician, how long is it going to take you? And, you know, the electrician's going to say, well, it'll take me about a week to get the rough end done. I say, well, you and how many? Well, I'll do that by myself. It'll take me one week. And, you know, I say, well, how, if I were to buy all the materials, what would you charge me? And now they were faced with giving me what their labor number was going to be. And, I could say, well, you know, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll reimburse you for all the materials. Um, but, you know, it's a week's worth of work. I'm not giving you $6,000 for a week's worth of work. You know, I'll, I'll, you know, what's a fair number for a week's worth of work? And, and you'll get all of these. And so that's the, that's the way I would break the conversations down. Um, but again, if you just go into the new home subdivisions, they're already used to working for less. And even if they double the number, most of the time, it's better than what you're getting elsewhere. Tim, you have anything you want to add or any thoughts that have come to mind? Well, yeah, the one of the secrets is having subcontractors who do all your work. Yes, absolutely. You have a team built so you don't constantly, don't be constantly shopping in them either, but all, but shop them once in a while, you know, shop their prices, just make sure they're still in line. But as far as the, the subs that some of the big builders are using, some of the national builders, you know, they, they get the bottom of the barrel a lot of times. And 
they make up for it in excessive management. A lot of these guys straight out of college who are their superintendents with a construction management degree, man, they burn those guys out in about two years. Man, they just work them to death because they're trying to manage people who need intensive management. So one of my strategies when I was building was to have competent people, not the most expensive necessarily, <clears throat> but probably not the cheapest either, but I didn't have to babysit them and manage them. So I saved, that's why I didn't have a superintendent. I just, I can just drive by the job site and see if they were there. And if they were there, I knew they were okay. And I could just drive on. So, but if I had some kind of, you know, people who, were probably just brand new in the business or whatever, didn't know what they were doing, and needed intensive management. Even though they might be cheaper, it's going to take up my whole day trying to manage them. So there's a balance there. Mm-hmm. But once you find a good person, yeah, make sure you pay him on time, on a regular basis. Don't drag them out, and they will be loyal. I agree. So. At the end of the day, I mean, I, I've sat here and I have talked a lot about new construction. Uh, it's it's the direction that I'm going. Uh, I could easily have fallen into I, I will tell you right before I met with this builder, I did bid on a big rehab project um, and being the new guy in town, just wanting to get something uh, moving. I mean, at first I have the ability to pay cash, so I made a cash offer. I actually offered too much. Um, just to get some momentum moving here in the Knoxville area. And then uh, uh, they decided to sell it to a family member. And so the next week I ended up meeting with this builder. But I will tell you, when I made the offer on that big rehab, and it was a big rehab, I was going to have to do a lot of gutting, and it was probably an eighty dollars to $100,000 rehab. It, was, it would have taken me longer to rehab that house than it will for me to build a new one. Um, that uh, there was a little bit of anxiety, like, man, why am I getting into such a big rehab? That's my first one in town. I don't even have a contractor yet to, to do this for me. I'm going to be out there, you know, working hard and long, trying to find the right person. Why couldn't I find an easy one to start with was sort of my thoughts. And, you know, having overbid on it, I thought I was going to get it. And uh, I thought it was a little bit of a blessing when I didn't get it. And especially now that I'm going down this path with the new home builder, I, I feel I feel pretty good about it. So uh, I share that just to say I was wide open to doing rehabs here in town as well. And, uh, and that is sort of my plug to say they're both good. I don't know that one is better than the other. Some are better for some people or better suited for some than others. And sometimes it's, what is the market giving you? Um, Do you live in an area where there's a lot of rehab opportunity as you might decide to go down that path. And if you're living in an area where, you know, har- homes are just hard to come by, sometimes it's easier to just be the person who builds the new one. Um, you can be smart about both businesses. You can structure them in such a way to really limit your risk. Um, you don't have to go all out. Uh, you'll never see me buying land uh, with the intent of building on it six months to a year from now. I'm not going to hold it for that long. I'm going to when I buy a lot, I'm ready to build. And we're, we're going to get started on that lot within, you know, a few weeks at the most. Um, I'm going to always never keep that kind of land in my inventory. I'm going to be ready to go when we do actually take it. So when I say the same thing to flippers, you know, get in there as quickly as you can, but you don't want to buy houses and become a house collector and sit on them for a while. Uh, Brent, you had asked, where do I live or what part of Tennessee? You've heard me mention Knoxville a couple of times now. I am in Knoxville on the west side of town. All right. Anybody else have anything? Hey, Steve, I have a quick question. So when you look at numbers, what's like sort of like the minimum potential profit per build or as a percentage of the sales price, what, what's that like minimum cushion you're looking for before, you know, you put a trigger to buy the law and, you know, do the construction? Well, I got to tell you that uh, somebody else was asking me that question a little while back. And oftentimes I'm, you know, I hear people telling me that, you know, new home construction, they make eight to 12%. I wouldn't do it if I was only making eight to 12%. Um, 
it just feels too way too tight for me. Yeah. Um, I can tell you that I have been making my career doing it with new construction. Uh, it's going to be anywhere from you know selling houses for 175 thousand that made 30 thousand in profit. So almost 20 percent, maybe 18, and that was when the market was really tight to um, making 60 to 80,000 building the same houses as the market opened up. And, uh, and so, you know, I think that you need to measure it. I wouldn't build a $500,000 house to make 30. Uh, I wouldn't even think twice about it. But uh, th this is where controlling lots in a, in a market that's rising uh, really can be helpful because it's actually, it's not the house that goes up in value it's the land underneath that actually goes up in value. So when you see a, a, and that's provided that construction costs and the, you know, the improvements and all that are cost the same. Today's a little bit different story. It's costing a lot more to build a house. So the actual improvements are going up too, but uh, it, it's land that goes up and down. So uh, if you can control a lot today at 50,000 and values keep on going up and say values go up 50,000. If improvements stay the same, it's the land that went up 50,000. And you get the benefit of that profit in the future when you build and it costs you the same amount to build in the future as it does today, but you pick up that extra 50. So uh, to make a long story short, after I built those three houses, I went to buy some more houses and to buy some more lots and the builder wanted to raise the price on me and i said why you know why are you raising the price on me and he said well because things are selling now i said to me i'm your buyer and nobody else is here to buy lots from you i'm the one buying it and so he said well my price went up and i said all right well i'm, I'm gonna pass i was just playing hardball with him um, I was waiting for him to come down and I just said, I'm, uh, I, I guess I'm not building any more houses. And I walked away. Well, I was having a discussion with my real estate agent. I said, you know, I got to go back and buy those lots. But, uh, I said, I'm going to make him sweat for a while. And she said, I said, I, I, I don't understand why he would do that to me, but she said, yeah, I don't understand why he would do that either. Not especially since the bank just listed all of those lots. And I said, what lots? And she said, well, the bank just listed 17 lots. And they were one block south of where we were building and all those foreclosures. I said, really, how much were they? And they were a lot less, about 30% less than what I had bought the original lots from him for. So I went into the bank and I said, uh, I want to buy all of your lots. And, uh, and the way that I did it was I said, I want to buy three of them now. And then in four, you know, in four months, I want to buy one more. And then every, I'll buy one a month from you until I've taken them all down. And the bank told me no. And uh, then uh, and I, this is a story that just doesn't add a whole lot of value, but give you an understanding. There was an article in the newspaper the following week that the bank was in trouble with the feds for all of their REO inventory and that they were ordered to get stuff off the books. So I walked right back into the bank and I made them uh, an even better offer for me than I made the week before. And I didn't give them the option of saying no, I basically said, here are your three options, pick one. And, uh, and they agreed to sell me all of the lots. And I ended up buying all of the lots from them for $15,000 each. And uh, now having said that, then the market opened up and things got better and the prices were going up. So the same homes that I was selling for 175, um, a year later, I was getting 235,000 and I had all my lots tied up at 15. And uh, so then the other guy who I bought the original lots from, so I'll just share with you the numbers. I bought the, the first three lots from him for 22. Then he wanted to raise the price on me to 25. Uh, after I finished off all those other lots, he waited another two, two and a half years and he didn't sell a single one of his lots because I was selling all the houses. I went back and I bought the rest of his lots from him for 16,250 per lot. Wow. And so um, he got less than what he sold the original ones to me for. And now here's an interesting thing. He did have two of them under contract and it was another builder. And I said, I'll buy, they, they were verbally, they were talking about it. And I said, I'll buy all of the lots from you 
but I want all of them. I said, if you sell to the other builder, I'm buying none of them. And, uh, and he pulled away from the other builder and sold all of them to me. And then I turned around and flipped the two to the builder. <laughs> nice. Got it. So it looks like Steve, 20 to 30 percent ish margin is the minimum that you're looking at before. Yeah. So I sold, I literally, I mean, I had a couple of them I sold for two twenty nine nine that I made just under eighty thousand dollars on. Wow. That's a nice margin. It's forty. That's a really nice margin. Mm -hmm. Thank so you. So twenty to twenty five is really good, and that's where I like to be. Okay. Thank you. How do you account for possible market correction today, 2003, 2005, at the height of the market, then the crash of 08? So, um, I mean, I was around then, and so I get it. Uh, for me, that's one of the reasons why I love the fact that I have such big spreads and I want that margin in there. Um, I, being a small investor, I don't want to go all out. I'm, I'm not interested in tying up 20, 25 lots. I'm not interested in having too many projects going at any given time. Uh, for argument's sake, and here's my thoughts and my philosophy, and this is different for everybody. I'm not saying that this is the way that it should be for all of you. Um, I'm paying cash for these houses that we're building right now. If the market crashed, I just hold on to them and keep them as rentals. I have the luxury of doing that, but um, it could be different for everyone. I because of what's going on in the market right now, the thought or the idea of having 10 flips going or 10 new constructions going or 20, you know, building something out that big to me just seems pretty risky. But, you know, again, that's a matter of perspective. If you've got the capacity to do a hundred and you're only doing 10 to 20, that's nothing. But, uh, you know, for me to go too big right now, um, I, I get it. The market is high. Uh, but I'm also going to throw out this one thing. Um, what's happening today is different than the 05, 06, 07, 08, you know, run up and crash. It's not the same. Um, there's really little inventory out there today, whereas there was inventory. Uh, you didn't pull up the MLS in 06, 07 and see as little out there as there is today. There was tons of stuff available to buy. Um, what was going on then? It was really a tremendous flip environment. People were buying things just to flip it. People are buying it today to move into. Um, it's it's a lot different environment today, and so much of what we're seeing as far as market run up is being driven by demand. And uh, mortgages are not easy to get like they were back in uh, 07, 08. Um, they're actually hard to get. They're they're really qualifying people. I did hear just yesterday that there were some um, stated income loans coming out again. I have not heard of that. Um, I mean, I, I would imagine that they never completely went away, but that's not the norm like it was back then. That, that is the exception to the rule versus what we were experiencing back then. So um, I'm asked all the time, and I'm just going to tell you, I'm being honest, I mean, humbly say, I have no clue what's going on in this market today or what's going to happen with it. I used to have a pretty good pulse. And, and I think people used to trust in what my feelings were about the direction of the market. And I'm actually, I, I just don't know. It doesn't, every single market is going up right now, whether it's collectibles, whether it's cars, whether it's the stock market, Bitcoin, real estate, um, everything is going up. And there's never been a time in history where every market was just thriving. And uh, so I don't know. Um, That's what uh, happens when you government prints a lot of fiat currency. Yep. I mean, I know it's driving it. It's all of this new printed money that's got to end up somewhere. Um, but I don't know what's going to happen with it. What's the end result? What's the end game of it? And, you know, ultimately the dollar potentially crashing uh, is is you know quite possible but then where do you want to be and it, literally we, i was having this discussion yesterday with someone and i said i think i want real estate because you know what's going to happen with bitcoin if the dollar crashes 
I don't know what's going to happen with my stocks if the dollar crashes. I don't know. But if I have real estate and it's, and it's a tangible thing, everybody's always going to want real estate and they're not making any more of it. They're not printing more of it. So, uh, you know, my feelings are that it's, it's where I want to keep the majority of my assets. All right, we got a, can, can I cash flow at today's rents if you had them? I, I, like I said, I'm paying cash. So yeah, there's a, there isn't anything underlying, but you know, if you're asking what my return would be, uh, if everything were crashing, whatever return I got would be good enough in my mind. Um, uh, you know, the other, the, the other flip side of that is yes, they will more than cash flow, even if I were to go and get mortgages on them and, and to, to finance them based off of what current rents are. These new homes, I'd probably get at least $2,000 a month in rent for them. And uh, if I were just to cash out and take my cash back out, I would be fine. Uh, Mike, yeah, we just said it's the money that's printing that's driving all of this. Uh, Mark, great question. Looking to put together a venture potentially with three partners where there would be himself, the builder, and an additional investor. And so uh, on a certain level, you know, if I wanted to do four or five um, more, uh, you know, houses, let, let's just say I wanted to have that much going, I might have to bring more money into the equation. So it would be me, the builder, and I would bring more money into the equation, bring another investor and I would structure it in such a way that makes sense. Um, you know, that what you need to look at from your perspective, Mark, is that you are the guy who is um, sort of directing everything. You're sort of the coach. You're, you're the one, you know, running the program. The builder needs to do his job. You want the money person to just stay out of it. The money person, you know, puts up the money and uh, gets their return at the end. But, you know, you mentioned that there's more headaches. You need to be clear about what each person's role is so that you can avoid those headaches. And Jason was just reminding me that uh, we are past our 90 minute allotted time limit here. And so I do want to continue to, the conversation. I do want to keep uh, the questions coming. I, I'd love to encourage everyone, if you are not in the Life and Air community yet, you can go to lifeandair.com and you can access our community there. Uh, there'll be links where you can jump in or you can download on your phone. You can download the app from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. You can download the Life in Air app. Uh, it's free to join, but uh, we can continue this conversation there. You can ask questions. I am always participating in there, happy to answer your questions. And uh, um, these are the kinds of conversations I love having. So. Uh, yes, uh, the replay will be made available. We will get that out to everyone. So hopefully I'll see you in the community with all of your questions. Thanks for showing up. I hope this call was of value to you. Have a great day.